I am so delighted to be here today and really excited to hear from our stakeholder panelists. So let's get to it. So we really have a tale of two crises here. We're not just reopening schools coming back from a pandemic, but we're coming back during a time of social upheaval and racial reckoning from the injustices that have occurred across this country. And during this time away from school, for many of us as individuals and certainly as a collective, our anxiety and our fear and our stress, and for some of us, our grief and our rage has increased while our proximity to our support networks at school and after school has often decreased. Now this isn't true for everyone, but collectively that's what we've been hearing. But we do know that many students actually thrived during this time away from school because school environments may not have been safe and supportive places before the pandemic and the social unrest. And in fact, many students have found a real sense of agency, purpose, and leadership during this time. So these are the things that school leaders will want to consider as we return to school and as we rethink the new normal. So our North Star is that safe and supportive relationships and environments promote resilience, they provide protective factors, and they create the conditions in which every person, regardless of age, can learn, grow, and thrive. As I said, for some, school was a place where this actually happened, so there was a real loss when schools closed. But for some, school was not a place where this happened. So what do we need to reconsider? rethink and revise as we reopen. So when we're teaching students or as leaders, when you're working with your staff, educators can engender safe and supportive environments that improve our ability to teach and improve our students' ability to engage and learn. Now, regardless of whether we're going back to school in person, remote, or some hybrid form of that, I encourage you to consider one important process. So this simple three R's framework offered by neuroscientist Bruce Perry can really guide our efforts in a trauma-informed way. And that's regulate, relate, and reason. Now Perry suggests that educators should closely follow the process of how to reach what he calls the learning brain. So beginning from the back of the brain and moving to the front. So in this order, we want to ensure that students and staff are first and foremost regulated in their reptilian brains, and that's at the back and bottom parts of our brain. So in order for us to effectively learn and thrive, we must first feel physically and emotionally calm and settled. So that's the regulate part. So we need to help students and staff find ways to return to school and feel grounded and centered first before we try moving into anything else. Now, once we do that, then we need to feel socially and emotionally connected through safe and supportive relationships that are attuned to people's needs. So that's the relate piece. Now this happens in the middle parts of our brains, also known as the limbic brain or the mammalian brain because it's what makes us mammals we actually have the capacity for connection here. Now, once we're calm and settled, and then we're connected in those healthy and supportive ways with others, then we're finally ready and able to engage with formal instruction and classroom learning. So that's the reason piece. And this happens in the top and the front parts of our brains, our neo-mammalian brains, which is what makes us human. So you can see if we try to jump straight into academic teaching and learning, we have completely bypassed what our brains need to actually get there. So if staff and students are showing up dysregulated because they're stressed and they're unsettled, or they're feeling disconnected from safe and supportive relationships and environments, we won't effectively or sustainably reach the learning brain. Now, what does this actually look like? So we're gonna dig into each of these starting with regulate. So supporting students to become regulated is educators' first priority. Now, given the major shifts in the formats and the schedules that distance learning or even learning with social distancing in place requires, 
and all of that exacerbated by stress or fear from the crises, students and staff and families may be more anxious than usual, especially for those already experiencing chronic and toxic stress or adverse experiences or even trauma. Now this looks different for everyone and this is super important here. So regulating activities for students may not look the same as what helps adults regulate or even what makes adults comfortable. So regulation may also look different across races and cultures. So some examples might include doodling. So does it mean that someone's not paying attention but the sensory integration actually helps them pay attention? Or being physically closer or physically separated from other people might help someone regulate, especially if they've had a negative interaction with a person. And then some students may find that listening to music helps them to calm or to focus, but we're often ripping those headphones out of students' ears. And then physical touch. So some students, especially younger ones, may want their back rubbed or may want a hug, while other students find physical touch really distressing. And then a final example is that some students may braid each other's hair or perform other grooming activities as a means to soothe one another. And that's actually a demonstration of co-regulation. So the bottom line here is really to consider your biases and work towards those developmentally appropriate and culturally responsive practices. Now to help students and staff feel more settled, school and district leaders can model and provide opportunities like beginning meetings or interactions or lessons with grounding and centering exercises that help students and staff focus on what is happening in their minds, in their bodies, and in their surroundings. So this can help them stay engaged and focused. And these simple exercises can be spoken, they can be recorded, they can be written in instructional packets, or they can be read aloud by an adult. So there are lots of options here for various formats and for languages and abilities. So for example, you could say before beginning this meeting or before beginning this lesson, close your eyes or turn your gaze down to the floor and take three deep breaths in through your nose and out through your mouth. Or you could ask students or staff to look around their environments and name one thing that makes them happy or calm or relaxed and explain why. Or you could ask students or even staff to scan their bodies for where they feel tense and for where they feel relaxed and then have them silently tell the tense parts to relax so they feel the same way that the calm parts do. Now those are just a few examples of some grounding and centering exercises. And another regulation strategy is to create structure and consistency through schedules, through regularly scheduled communication, and clear and concise instructions. So examples of this would be to either revisit or co-create new norms, new school-wide expectations or classroom expectations, and rituals that are safe and welcoming and inclusive and through a student-centered lens. So again, not necessarily things that keep the adults comfortable, but things that are inclusive and healthy and safe for students. And then a few more regulate strategies would be to create even more opportunities than usual for breaks and physical activities, whether this is in-person or remote. You can promote self-awareness by providing opportunities for students and staff and families to communicate their feelings. And then you can promote self-regulation by providing activities and strategies for relaxing or calming activities. I just named a few. And then offer suggestions for ways to meet people's different sensory needs. We have light and seating and room temperature. All these sorts of things affect people's sensory needs and then provide choices for both stakeholder input and output to accommodate individual styles, preferences, and needs. So we have more examples of what those might look like in a trauma-informed distance learning brief, and all of those can be modified for various developmental levels as well as for in-person and hybrid options. So we can share that in the chat box. Okay, so moving on to relate. 
You know, now more than ever, it is so important for leaders and teachers to promote positive, healthy relationships with their staff and their students and with their families by noticing and being sensitive to what they need and really being attuned to those needs and responding in warm, inclusive, and supportive ways. So for example, consider how you perceive and respond to challenging behaviors, whether that's of your students, your families, or your staff, and reframe those challenging behaviors as communication. It is telling you a story or it's revealing an underlying need. Many people's involuntary fight, flight, and freeze reactions may actually look like defiance or non-compliance or task avoidance, but these behaviors are simply a symptom of their underlying brain function and often a reaction to the systemic oppression that people experience. So understanding this may help you become aware of the needs of your students, your families, and your staff, and to be able to respond appropriately. We also wanna to seek to respond versus react. So reactions are those automatic, reflexive, and unconscious things that they often result from our previous experiences and they become conditioned over time. By contrast, responses are thoughtful and intentional. So understanding which behaviors by others tend to activate you and learning how to regulate yourself are both important strategies for helping you address the needs of students, families, and staff, and for teaching them how to regulate themselves. Another important aspect of RELATE is to be really intentional about creating space and opportunities for healthy interactions and for explicitly addressing the importance of safe and supportive social connections. So a strategy that works well is to ensure that every student is connected to a caring, reliable adult, and it could be one of their choosing, and make sure that there are consistent and regular opportunities for that connection to happen. And then similarly, some students need this connection with a caring peer, especially if they're often excluded or they're new to the school system. Now, the same is true for staff and families, and our panelists, Veronica and Kayleen, have some really great things to share about that later. Bottom line is that we want to emphasize caring connection. We also have two briefs that we put out earlier this year on self-care and collective care that talk about some of these uh, topics. And um, the first webinar in this series actually had some great strategies around that. So we can link to those into the chat box as well. So last but not least, we have some strategies for reason. Now, first and foremost, be realistic and gentle with yourself and your colleagues and encourage them to do the same with others. We are navigating a whole new way of being in the work. So don't be so hard on yourself. Allow yourselves and your staff the time and the space to figure out this new normal and give yourselves and your staff the permission for trial and lots of error. Be patient, prioritize, and then let some things go for yourselves and for your colleagues for your students, for your families. You know, reducing workloads for yourself and for others can actually open up time and space for creative and innovative solutions and increased learning. Now, in terms of those higher order skills, which require those front and top parts of the brain, we can support executive functioning and self-management skills by breaking work into smaller pieces. And then before using lessons, texts, activities, and videos, ensure that they are not activating for students and families. Ensure nonviolent communication is used. And here's a quick disclaimer. If violent words are activating for you, mute your speakers for a moment because I'm going to provide you just a couple examples of what that looks like. So avoid words like trigger or aim and avoid words or phrases like take a stab at it or shoot me an email. So those are all phrases that we commonly use that can be activating for people. And last but not least, learning isn't just passive, like a teacher presenting material to students or a student reading text. 
So how can we create opportunities for student-led learning? As I mentioned, many students have shown great resiliency and leadership skills during this pandemic and through the civil unrest and protests. These actually created opportunities for them in ways that they did not have before. So we wanna ensure that we're providing opportunities to students to demonstrate their agency and leadership skills at all ages. We also know that when students find meaning and purpose in their work, they are more engaged. So what lessons can we take from the challenges of the last few months? And how can we rethink the ways that we do school and the ways that we show up as allies for our students? So as I wrap up here, here are some guiding thoughts for the return to school and our panelists will begin digging into what each of these looks like more as well. So listen first to your students, to your families, and to your staff, and then develop a plan in partnership with them so that they are equal partners where learning and supports are done with them, not to them or for them. And then set up conditions for healing and success. I ran through a lot of examples in the last few slides, but make sure students and staff are heard, they're feeling settled and safe, and they're feeling supported before we try jumping into any of the academic content. And then continue to reflect on our policies and practices. Are they equitable? Are they inclusive? Or are they punitive and exclusionary and creating more disparities? And continuously refine them in partnership with students and families so that we can create an equitable system that really reflects the voices of all the people involved. Okay, now I'm gonna turn it over to our students, Zoe and Emmanuel. Thanks so much for having us. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, so today we're gonna to speak to students as partners in creating a new normal, really going off of everything Christina has been saying um, and going from that uh, my, like mindset of doing things for students or to students to as she emphasized the with. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. Um, and we are a group of about 100 students um, working across the state in Kentucky, um, totally self-selected. We have no application process. Um, and we work to engage students as partners in the efforts to improve schools, specifically with regards to research, policy, and advocacy. And you'll see that we do that in many different ways, um, and it, it takes on many forms. So we amplify and elevate student voice. Um, and I think there's another word that's really crucial here, which is that we integrate students as partners, um, specifically thinking about engaging students in places and spaces where they typically aren't included. And being really mindful of what integrating students into the broader public discourse about education looks like. Um, and our, we're part of a larger organization called the Pritchard Committee that's been mobilizing citizens in Kentucky to do this work for over 30 years. So meaningful student voice takes on many forms, as I was saying. We don't think of student voice just as expression of what you might visualize as a young person holding up a sign and protesting. Um, we really like to think about the idea of moving from protest to policy making and students informing action around making schools more equitable. So that can look like consultation where students are brought in for a focus group um, or they do a survey, but a decision has likely been made or is in the process of being made and students are kind of being brought in after the fact. Um, presence and participation are two areas where there's more co-design, but we're still not at a co-equal partnership um, the way we are when we get to these higher levels of activism and leadership. Um, and this is where um, our work really takes place and where we try to help other organizations and groups, whether they're youth-led or adult-led, whether uh, it's with legislators or more are at the grassroots level, we try to help uh, other students and adults um, recognize how powerful it can be to reach these more meaningful levels. And the project that Zoe is gonna speak to today is, is just a manifestation of that. 
Yeah, um, thank you so much, and, uh, Emmanuel. And just as she said, this is really, I think, the perfect project um, exemplifying that intergenerational research um, that's really students advocating for policy change. So here at um, the Student Voice Team, we recently launched our Coping with COVID-19 Student-to-Student Study um, with research partners at the University of Kentucky. And so we're looking at how students are coping and feeling school closures in this pandemic. And it has two main components. Part one being the survey that we um, released in around mid-May, which garnered almost 13,000 responses from all 120 counties in Kentucky. And then part two being 50 peer-to-peer -peer interviews that is going currently through IRB approval. Next slide, please. So um, trying to keep it short, there are a lot of things that we're finding, but we really wanna focus on that there are some really serious equity stratifications, whether you're looking at morality, looking at race or socioeconomic status with students and how they're experiencing this pandemic. So as you can see on the slide, students who are in metro areas are typically communicating more with their teachers per week than students in rural areas. And we're also noticing that meaningful um, teacher communication is really important for keeping students engaged and motivated with their schoolwork. Next slide, please. So um, here we have a lot of different charts, but I'll kind of run you through them quickly. So we're seeing that students are feeling that their work is less meaningful. The percentage of students saying that they felt their work was meaningful dropped by 40%. Uh, we are seeing that overall students say that they, uh, students saying that they never understood their learning is increasing by tenfold. And specifically, the graphs that are on the slides here are um, aggregated by socioeconomic status. So you can see how students in poor or working poor classes are experiencing greater decreases in these positive educational attitudes, which is really highlighting the importance of focusing on students who are being least heard and have the least resources when we're returning back to school. Next slide, please. Uh, we are also seeing similar equity trends with student behaviors. So um, overall, we're seeing decreases in students communicating with their friends, but we're seeing that students are spending more time um, doing things for fun, more time outside, and also more time sleeping. Um, but as you can see on those bullet points that Latino and Asian students are communicating much less than other racial or um, ethnic groups in our survey. And we're also noticing that students with less consistent access to Wi-Fi are also reporting less sleeping. Um, communicating with friends and having fun as well, showing that importance of having really good internet access um, for quality of life in this distance learning environment. Next slide, please. So on now kind of onto things that we want to address with all of these findings. So overwhelmingly, we are seeing that students agree with having a flexible attendance policy, especially students who consider themselves high risk for COVID-19, students and students who consider themselves in poor and working poor socioeconomic groups. Um, we know that from distance learning, and I'd say even in-person learning, that students sitting in the chairs are not the same thing as engaged learning, and that attendance doesn't exactly translate perfectly into the e-learning space. Um, so kind of hitting on what Christina was saying about regulating, about how you know students can't as easily take breaks on the e-learning without just stepping away from the computer. So thinking about ways we can count attendance for school measurement purposes, but also give students the flexibility they need with changing home responsibilities and also changes in just socio-emotional wellness. Um, also in terms of this current moment, we really need to start looking at our role of police in our schools through the form of school resource officers. There are numerous studies that show that the presence of SROs in our schools perpetuate a school to prison pipeline and that disproportionately affects Black and Latino students. And similarly, re similarly rethinking discipline both in this e-learning space, but in general, um, given that we know that those disproportionately affect students of color and how we can you know, really prioritize better outcomes for those students when engaging um, with SROs or administrators in a discipline context. Next slide, I'll hand it back to Emmanuel. Thanks so much. So uh, highlighting just a couple uh, points as we wrap up is this co-creation um, and one of the ways we think it's important to do that uh, is through dialogue, even just educators taking a minute before diving into content, whether it's in a classroom or on Zoom, uh, really thinking about, hey, how are you? Just acknowledging um, and pivoting um, and being flexible. Um, also, 
you know, for a little bit less uh, meaningful, but using surveys as a tactic for meaningful share back and letting students be a part of shaping their education, both in terms of curriculum and pedagogy. So not just the what of our learning, but the how. Um, including students on committees and decision making decision making bodies and um, our group, the Pritchard Committee Student Voice Team, is part of the larger Education Justice Collective, which is made up of youth-led education equity organizations across the country, um, thinking through what it looks like um, in the midst of these dual pandemics um, to address uh, our our school system and how we improve it. So um, this ecosystem approach and an anti-racist education is really important. And if you'll go to the next slide, um, I'll just highlight a few of, of our guiding principles, which you can check out. I think the link is gonna be shared in the chat. So we wanna share that students must have a voice that shapes their education. A just response to COVID-19 has to prioritize support for marginalized students. Students' basic needs must be completely met. Um, we need to work on closing the digital divide, cultivating a positive school climate and culture, moving away from standardization and recognizing that one size fits all instruction and evaluation doesn't work. Um, talking about uh, what it looks like to equip students as critical civic actors, um, supporting teachers and school staff. So these demands are really just a framework um, for us to uh, address the, these crises um, and move forward. Uh, you can reach us um, at these places and also um, connect with us on the Move School Forward site. Thanks so much. All right. Well, thank you so much, Zoe and Emmanuel. You are always so impressive when you show up with all of your wisdom. Um, I just want to say, you know, I've seen a few comments in the chat, um, but the power of youth voice is really a force for equity. Um, and I think, you know, in schools and districts, we we get stuck in how do we do this? And I think they just offered some really clear, simple examples of simply listening and dialoguing with students can have profound shifts in the ways that we show up as allies in the work. So I have a question for the students here. Um, have you seen any good examples of revised attendance policies um, as, as we're speaking to sort of this, you know, kids in seats doesn't equal um, engagement. Are there any examples that you've seen out there um, that you feel like have been more equitable or more effective? Yeah, um, I can speak from my own personal experience. Um, each of my classes kind of took this approach a little bit differently, um, but just not requiring students to be there for the synchronous parts of lessons. Uh, you know, while by no means the perfect approach, kind of getting a lot of our assignments to us on Monday and getting to decide how we manage throughout the week, I think is really important for a lot of students, especially for students who had to work more hours or their parents were losing hours or pay at work. So just having to adjust to that kind of new home experience. Um, so I think that, I think giving students as much flexibility as possible, but especially highlighting that flexibility and what that looks like looks different for all students. Um, so like what Emmanuel was mentioning, just asking your students, like, how do you want me to give you those assignments every week? Do you want these Zoom calls to be mandatory, I think is really the best way of tapping into student voice in a really meaningful way with that. Yeah, and one, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say one clear example of that, um, as Zoe mentioned, I had a teacher who let us choose between attending um, a Zoom class or doing um, more that we just sent into her. And I think even a choice as simple as that, although it was not co-created, does give us more freedom and is definitely a start. It can be really simple. Great, those are really helpful, thank you. Do you have any ideas about how you engage leaders in supporting some of these shifts, where it, whether it's shifts in attendance policies or shifts in discipline policies? Are you bringing them any sort of evidence to support those conversations? What does that look like for you all? I think it can look uh, so many different ways, um, but one thing that we suggest is that from the beginning, um, students are included in 
the process um, and the design or the uh, vision, the strategic goals, whatever it may be, um, that students are not just a kind of stop on the road or a checkbox uh, on the to-do list, but a fundamental uh, shift in power in how we uh, create policies and practices. Um, we know that these are affecting us primarily, and so we should be partners in crafting and shaping them. Absolutely. We have about one more minute. Zoe, do you have anything you want to add to that? Or is there any, um, any more examples that you have of what it really looks like for you to not just be tokenized uh, sort of on decision making committees, but like really integrally involved? Yeah, and I think the easiest way to not tokenize students is to really listen. So I think we have a lot of like student representatives, but they don't have voting power. They can't, you know, submit motions in these committees. Um, so I think treating students as equals um, is the first step. And I will uh, I know I saw a question in the comment about does this work with younger students? And I actually was on a committee when I was in fourth grade. And like we made decisions about how our school ran. And we were all like nine years old. And I just, there's so many young students who are totally capable of this. It's just a matter of giving them a seat at the table. Because when students learn that they aren't supposed to speak, then they don't. So teaching students that their voice is valued is the most important step, I think, in really engaging with student voice, especially at a really young age like that. I really love that example, Zoe, because I think everyone thinks that student voice and choice all happens at the secondary level, um, but there are opportunities at all levels to involve students in developmentally appropriate ways. So thank you all so much um, for bringing your voice to this conversation. I know that it has been incredibly helpful to the leaders that are listening uh, today. So with that, we're going to shift over um, to our family voice, uh, Veronica Crespin Palmer. So Veronica, you wanna go ahead? Thank you. Thank you all so much for having me here today. It's an honor and pleasure to be here with you. Um, and thanks also for joining. This is a really busy time. So we appreciate you all joining to learn alongside us. So at RISE Colorado, we're working to build the family-led movement for educational equity through family engagement and community organizing. We are based in Aurora, Colorado, which is the most diverse school district and city in the state. We have families from over 130 countries speaking over 160 different languages. And I wanna share a little bit about why I got into this work. So you'll see pictured here, my grandmother, Alberta, She's four or five, she's small but fierce and mighty. And she grew up in the projects in downtown Denver, the Lincoln Projects, was involved in a gang, got pregnant with my dad in high school, dropped out and went on welfare. She realized the only way to end that cycle of poverty and violence was through education. So as a single mom of three, while my grandfather was incarcerated in prison, she crossed the street from the projects to Auraria campus and got her GED, bachelor's and master's and became a social worker for Denver Public Schools for 25 years. So my grandmother, Alberta, single-handedly transformed my family's trajectory for generations to come by pursuing an education. And because she went to college, my dad also went to college. He's also a social worker in DPS. I went to college and now my two Afro-Latino children while also go on to college. And my grandmother taught me the power of family engagement. And when families know how to navigate the education system, anything and everything is possible. And again, it transforms families' lives for generations to come. So next slide. So thanks to my grandmother, Alberta, I was inspired to co-found Rise Colorado. I'm a former teacher. I taught in Los Angeles and then came back home to start Rise. And at RISE, our theory of change is that those most impacted by the inequity that exists must lead the movement for change themselves. So if you study our most successful social justice movements in the United States and also in the world, they have always been led by those most impacted. So for example, Dr. King um, and African Americans led the civil rights movement and Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta led the farm workers movement. Um, and so we must ask ourselves, who's most impacted by educational inequity? It's low-income families and families of color, therefore they must lead with us alongside and behind them as allies. 
And also if you study these most successful social justice movements, they've always had a very strong organizing component. So we at RISE believe that it's very important we bring authentic community organizing to education if we're ever going to truly achieve educational equity. And so what does the research say about this? The research says that there is significant positive correlation between school, family, and community involvement in student success. So we know a lot of people want to do family and community engagement, but don't always know how. So that's what we do at RISE is help build the capacity because we must do family engagement at a much higher, deeper level to have the student success we all want and need to see for our children. Next slide, please. So it's important that we ground ourselves in reality. So what is the average span of time in a school community? And I wanna give a big thank you to my colleague, Kenya Bradshaw at TNTP, who actually created this slide through research. So superintendent's average span is six years, school board, five years, and students and parents, 18 years. So it's really important to think about our students and families with their 18 years and really think about all the incredible things they could do to support school board and superintendents who will turn over during their lifetime to really create that long lasting systemic change and policies we so desperately need to achieve educational equity and incredible academic gains for our low income students and students of color. Next slide, please. So as we think about the really important question of what do families and communities need as students return to school to feel connected and supported. And our work at RISE with multilingual, multiracial families, because we work with Black, Latinx, immigrant and refugee families, families are saying they need to feel cared for, listened to, and validated. Families have been through a lot during the pandemic. All of us have been through a lot, but our families most impacted have endured a deeper level of trauma and stress that we really need to understand and really build those caring environments where we all feel listened to and validated. Families also really need holistic wraparound services. Here I want you to really think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Families need food, mental health support, housing assistance, direct cash assistance. Not saying that schools and districts have to do all this alone, absolutely not. Nobody could do all this alone, but how could schools and district really look to your community partners? For example, us at Rise Colorado, really working with Aurora Public Schools to support with food, mental health, housing assistance, and direct cash assistance, because we must all be doing this together and not in separate silos. And then also, families need the opportunity to share input and feedback often during the reopening and recovery period, so their needs and challenges are being met in real time. So this is a real opportunity for the education system to create systems and infrastructure where, you know, there's rapid fire surveying systems or text response systems where families can respond to the very rapid change, changes happening due to the pandemic. So their voices can be heard and centered, and again, their needs met in real time. Next slide, please. So what does the research say about this piece as well? Um, so Dr. Joyce Epstein really talks about the need for family-like schools and school-like families. So especially now, now more than ever, how can we make sure that our schools feel like a family where it recognizes each child's individuality, it welcomes all families, not just families that are easy to reach and that children really do, children and their families really do feel welcomed and like they're wanted and cared for in their schools. And then with school like families, how can we really support our families to and share with them how to create a home like school environment where they can really reinforce the importance of school, homework and activities to build their students success and skills and feelings of success overall. So it's really important right now, again, for family like schools and school like families. Next slide, please. And then to Emmanuel and Zoe's point, and also what was shared earlier, how can schools and districts work with families versus doing two or four families? We at RISE really believe that it's important to teach families how to fish, fish for themselves, 
and that we do not do the fishing for them because we believe in families and their power and their resiliency and how they could do anything and everything with the right supports, skills, tools, and mindsets. So we really need to adjust our mindsets as an education system and really and truly believe that low-income families of color care value and have time for their children's education. These are some mindsets that are pervasive in the education system and might even be further compounded due to the pandemic. But we really need to understand that our families love and care for their children and they want to be involved, but it's not always the way we ask them to be involved. So we need to ask families, what way do you wanna be involved in your child's education and support them and honor them with that? We also need to see families as the experts and leaders. They are key to their children's education. They are experts on what their child's hopes and dreams are in addition to their child. So how can we really see them as experts and leaders and partner with them in those ways? And trust families and students. We need, as an education system, need to provide families with the space to share their challenges and the conditions to co-create solutions with education systems to address those challenges. So we need to create space and conditions where families can be very open and honest about the challenges they're facing and therefore what their solutions are to work alongside the education system and not work in opposition of each other. So Arise, we're really working hard to bring families and the education system back together to have that healing and reckoning that is so needed so we can work together as one instead of in opposition to one another. Next slide, please. So Dr. Karen Mapp and Henderson have really incredible research that talks about one of my favorite things is that when families and communities organize to hold schools accountable, studies suggest that school districts make positive changes in policy, practices, and resources. So again, if we look at the most successful social justice movements in the world's history, they're always led by those most impacted and they have really strong community organizing components alongside it. So just as Dr. Mapp and Dr. Henderson have shared, when families and communities organize, that helps improve policy changes, practices, and resources. So how can we bring authentic community organizing to the social justice movement of educational equity? Next slide, please. So we at RISE encourage you all to rise with your families and students. Work alongside them, listen to them, center them, because they're the most impacted during this pandemic. And they're incredibly important stakeholders of our education system. And there needs to be an incredible power shift and shift in power dynamics where families are seen as experts and leaders are leading alongside us. And we are no longer doing things to them or for them, but absolutely with them because they are incredible leaders who are ready now more than ever to lead for educational equity. Thank you. Wow, Veronica, thank you so much. And once again, we have the power of family voice as a real force for equity. And I really appreciated you acknowledging and affirming um, the real history, uh, not the things that we've been learning in our white privileged classrooms of past times, and also really hitting home the key issue of those mindset shifts that are so critical for us to really change our practice. So we had a couple of questions um, and patterns of questions that were coming up. Um, what are some good strategies for the family engagement you're talking about in these remote contexts, especially if families have no access to Wi-Fi or other technology like telephones and things like that? Yes, so we've learned over 40% of our families do not have access to Wi-Fi. So the digital to digital divide is very real. So we've gone old school and we are calling families. Uh, most families do have um, smartphones. So we're calling families, checking with them weekly to see how they're doing, what supports do they need in terms of food and direct cash assistance, but also in terms of their child's education. Right now in Aurora, it's time to register children. So making sure families are registered, know how to access those registration sites, and that also they have the access to um, the technology they need, and if not, how to advocate for that. We also have WhatsApp channels, text groups, Facebook groups, so that families can interact with one another. 
because we're actually, our coalitions have doubled and tripled in size since the pandemic started in March. And that was confusing at first of how is this happening in the middle of a pandemic? But it makes a lot of sense that families want to come together. They want to connect and have support systems. So how can our teachers, our educators, and our school staff really create those channels and those groups where families can come together and support one another. So it's not all on the school, but families really do want to work together and support each other's needs. So how do we create those systems and processes for families to connect? So it's not all on the school, but the school provides the conditions and opportunities to do so. So I really recommend, you know, just calling families really works, WhatsApp groups, text groups, Facebook groups. Um, and then also just asking families, how do you all want to connect? You all are very busy right now. What works best for you? And really meeting them where they're at. Great, that's so helpful, thank you. And another question that we have is, you know, family engagement seems to be so challenging for many schools, especially when the demographics of staff are different than the communities that they're working in. Um, so how might we really just sort of get started and begin those family school community partnerships mm -hmm. and what might be a good bridge for that to happen? Great question. So one of the first things is mindsets. It's very true that nationally, our teaching population um, and our education system is not reflective of the families and communities that we are teaching and educating. So first and foremost, having the mindsets, as I talked about earlier, that families do care, they do want to be involved and do value their children's education. Let's remember that many families cross the border or came here from a refugee camp or families of color who have been here in the US who have been disenfranchised and marginalized for so long have many have risked their lives and many have risked a lot and sacrificed a lot for their children to get an excellent education. So how can we really check our mindsets to believe in families and support them? But also, you know, family advisory councils are fantastic. How can those be a place where families can come together and really share their perspective and voice? Like Emmanuel and Zoe said, families need a seat at the decision-making table. So fam things aren't just being done to them, but with them. And how can families co-create policies and practices and procedures at the school, curriculum, budgeting. So really seeing family advisory councils with true power in decision-making for family leaders to be a great space for families to really lead and be part of the school community in authentic, game-changing ways. Thank you so much. We have a lot, many more questions actually, but I think we'll save those until the end. So we're hearing you all about those hard to reach families, more strategies for that. We're also hearing the more examples about the, the teach them to fish uh, examples. So we will return to those at the end uh, for our Q and A, but for the sake of time and making sure that our staff voice is heard, we're gonna now move on to uh, Dr. Kayleen Case. Kayleen. Thank you so much, you guys. I want to thank everyone that's making time to be a part of this amazing team so we can really be the prime agent for change. I come to you from Douglas County in Colorado and what I'm going to try to do is highlight some of those themes that we've heard from our educators so that we can support and connect with our staff but also our students and families. And what brings me a lot of passion as we hear our presenters today is that we have a golden thread. We all need relationships and connections. We need to be valued and heard and be a part of meaningful decision making. So thank you so much for coordinating this webinar to send out to everyone. I wanna start with the fact that we know that an individual's perception that they're valued and esteemed by the people in their social network is going to do a lot of different things. First, it's going to enhance personal functioning. It's going to assist in coping adequately with the stressors that come up. And it also may advert, um, buffer them from those adverse outcomes that we've talked about. It's really critical as leaders that we create this for our staff. We need to empower the relationships among all of the stakeholders as we've been hearing here today. You know, there've been a lot of examples in different school districts where we've included parents, students, educators, community partners and agencies, medical providers, and so much more. 
overwhelmingly what we've heard from educators is that in-person teaching was truly the preferred platform to facilitate learning and to build those connected relationships. We've also heard that high levels of stress and anxiety are palpable. We need to have an understanding of how to inform plans that create both physical and mental health and safety for everyone in this climate is gonna be essential. I think it's really inherent that through these difficult times, what we can do is focus on what's in the realm of our control. So a couple ideas that came to mind is one large metro school district set up an application and survey process to really gauge the interest in their individual community to have participants from different sectors be actively engaged in focus groups. After they came together, they sent out a variety of survey questions to hear the pulse and have a wide representation of voices within that community. Things that really stood out to me is that there was frequent communication in this process and the leaders modeled inquiry, flexibility, and compromise to create those supportive plans that were inclusive and relevant for this community. Now, as I speak to you today as school leaders, I really want to have us be mindful of the fact that when we elicit feedback from our different stakeholders, it is very important for us to be intentional about how that feedback is being collected, how we will process the information, and really collectively come together to form compromise to have that plan. We also need to build confidence in our staff so that they can access the available school and district resources that are in your community. We can offer training to support professional skill development. I would recommend doing this both asynchronously and synchronously. We can define what the roles and responsibilities are for our mental health providers, building and instructional teams to create a system of support for staff and students. It's gonna be really important to explore that collective effect that COVID-19 has had on your individual community. When we think about our problem solving models in schools, you may wanna consider the multi-tier system of support approach, as well as restorative practices. We can create those natural platforms for parents, students, and educators to come together. Let there be space for shared experiences, identifying needs and hearing through their lenses. We don't know if we don't ask. Determine the level of involvement also that your community agencies and partnerships have, as well as wraparound support during these times in your community. So as we're getting ready to see what this new school year has for us, we can go ahead and build some conditions of success by starting with a sense of cohesion, participation, and safety so that we're willing to be vulnerable and truly authentic to share what our needs are. Research has shown us that this is gonna to lead to us developing resilience through our experiences. The cool thing about resilience is we're not born with it necessarily. We can grow it and we can share together to be stronger. Um, inclusive, influential, and ongoing community collaboration is essential. There's different values, beliefs, and preferences for accepting support. There are spaces that we can offer for our individuals to share. I would recommend let's do this virtually and in person. Ask our stakeholders what works for them while we're including them. Encourage staff to model and practice self-care. It really begins with us. We're the barometers for our environment and we can mirror calm, confident leadership by engaging in this. We can be inclusive. Every school professional that you're gonna be supporting this year is going to need an outlet. Invite parents, students, and community helpers to share ideas and grow together. As we work towards rebuilding and healing our community, consider using the restorative practice framework so that we can facilitate these conversations. Some areas I recommend are self-awareness, reflection, promoting agency and building classroom community. So some questions you see here at the bottom of your slide, what makes relationships work out well? How do you manage stress? And what is the time that you felt stereotyped? These are just a few examples. When we learn about others' perspective, empathy grows, and these are the conditions to give all of us a sense of belonging, build community, and combat feelings of isolation and being alone. As we move into the next part, Veronica touched on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. 
Now, contextually, we also can consider the social determinants of health framework. Not only are they including our food insecurity and housing instability, but we're gonna consider substance misuse and interpersonal safety. You know, this current pandemic has been a stressor that's prolonged, uncertain, and unpredictable. It's affected all of us globally. However, each individual response will be different. While there is a global effect, every narrative and perspective is individualized. Our educators were asked to diversify their skills to include virtual platforms with little notice. Vital student contact was altered and the opportunity to process and grieve was minimalized due to the urgency of closing our schools. There was a cumulative effect for staff, students, and families. We've heard many messages, conflicting opinions, and solutions during this process. Leaders are gonna need to monitor the current trends and advice specific to their community and stakeholders while creating plans that work for everyone. The power is really now being present and engaging everyone. We are currently in a state of unknown for so many reasons related not only to the pandemic, but social unrest. So to combat this, we can model flexibility in our thoughts and our actions. These attributes facilitate an effective baseline for solutions and creating actionable steps to address needs. It goes back to the three R's that Christina was speaking of. In reviewing the research, it's really very clear that when we're having unknowns, fears, stigmas, unpleasant emotions, the best thing we can do to ameliorate this is to have open, authentic communication that can generate ideas, plans, and solutions from everyone. Now, as I say these words, I know it can be easier said than done, but as we're part of this journey, I encourage you as leaders and to have yourself as well as your entire staff engage in self-assessment. Know where you're at. Affirm that it's okay to be vulnerable and say we don't know right now. We can set boundaries and model coping strategies that lead to self-care throughout the day. Utilize timers to ensure that you get movement, breaks, nutrition, and rest so that you can reset. Identify and accept feelings. Normalize and regulate emotions in a variety of settings. I encourage you to pick three to five coping strategies that are your preference, write them down, and intentionally model them, showing your staff that you use them. For example, we can say that when we're stressed, exhausted, or frustrated, we can stretch, get a drink of water, practice mindfulness, progressive muscle relaxation. Engaging our five senses is really powerful. We can evoke a positive or renewing memory. There's many, many out there. You really need to choose what is right for you and authentic for you. So during this rebuilding process, it's really going to be necessary to define what is important, why it is important, and what you're trying to accomplish in your unique setting. So there's some typical norms around this engagement in the literature that shows that we should be authentic. Don't try to be someone you're not. Don't assume how others are feeling. That can be a tricky one. Respect that individual choices are theirs to make, but also do what is right for you, you and yourself. And then, you know, we're here for a reason and we have a passion that drives us to do what we're doing. So if we can identify what's motivating us, we're gonna be pretty powerful putting this together for this year. As I move into some of the strategies specific that we may wanna do, I really wanna highlight that it's so vital to support your staff and their emotional well-being. A trauma-informed lens is really gonna foster that collective care. We know that as we're putting information out in the system, we wanna use clear, concise communication that is relevant and meaningful for your setting, for your school and your teams. Remember that due to those variable stress responses that we talked about, time is gonna be a key component to really engage in this process. Staff may have visceral, visceral physiological responses to their perceived threats and so many unknowns. It's gonna be critical to support their abilities to regulate, relate, and respond in this new normal. Some ideas around this is to set up a natural support system that can be like a grade level or team level planning session. We can assign groups to serve as peer support 
Take advantage of technology and link your different school buildings together through virtual platforms where like-minded positions can be in a think group, if you will, to support each other. Provide staff with tools and resources to develop their social and emotional skills. Um, it's gonna be really uh, important, and I think important to consider, to create a safe space for your staff so that they can renew and rest with tools that lead to both mental and physical being. So some examples, I know space and time are such a commodity in schools, but if we can give a quiet space where there's materials to support guided meditation, nutrition, offer sequence stretching that address common muscle tension areas, our staff is gonna feel valued. We can offer collegial activities for staff to share, practice and learn together. I think it's gonna be really important to provide consistent planned time to engage in these active conversations so that we can keep a, a sense of what the current pulse of our setting is gonna be, putting those on our calendar proactively versus reactively. Um, by providing the opportunities to just really come together, we're gonna to create that community and we're affirming value for everyone, our educators, our families and our students. So research supports us that providing staff with tools to develop their own self-awareness and self-care management, we create, facilitate effective educators, but most importantly, contented educators. So I guess while framing our priorities, the number one takeaway to support educators is going to be create a space where they're valued, listened to, and involved in the decision-making process. Thank you. All right, Kayleen, thank you so much. And again, just feeling like having that staff voice is a force for equity. So when we can bring everyone's voices together, um, we can really create a more equitable environment for everyone. One of the things I really appreciated about Kayleen bringing up was really thinking about what's in our locus of control because there's so much that we don't have control over generally, but especially right now. Um, so Kayleen, one of the questions that's coming in is about how do we support teachers when they don't feel safe returning to in-person classrooms yet? What, what can we do to kind of mitigate some of that fear or even um, think about alternatives to, to, feel, to returning to school? Thank you for bringing that up. And as I work in various settings, this is a very real concern. And it's confusing because of all of the different opinions. So I'm gonna go back to being open and authentic using the hallmarks of the conversations that I highlighted, but I think really drilling down facts, what we're doing as leaders in schools to keep staff safe, as well as to keep students safe. Also, I think having alternative plans, much like we have different platforms for students to demonstrate learning and participation and families, we should do the same for our educators. So if they have vulnerable needs or concerns, work with your school district and HR department to be able to build in accommodations and supports. Because at the end of the day, our stress response is based on our individual narrative and schema that we've created through our experiences in our life. And part of us being aware and responsive in this situation is gonna to be to hear what those concerns are. Take the time to tease out the specifics around what are they feeling unsafe about and see how we can mitigate those things through the collaborative uh, discussion. Yeah, so I'm still, I'm hearing the same things coming up, right? Listening to your stakeholders and co-designing what safe looks like and what safe feels like. So I really appreciated those comments, um, Kayleen. Uh, we have time for one more question now. We do have time at the end as well, so we'll make sure we get to as many as we can today. Um, but how can we bring administrators along so that these issues will be integrated into plans and implementation? I think that's fantastic. As administrators, uh, we really set the climate and culture of our building, right? So I think time is such a commodity. We need to be able to demonstrate the value of doing these things and how it's going to really maximize the educational experience of our students, staff, and family, regardless of what our setting looks like, whether it's in person, online, or a blended program. So having those conversations, being clear and concise and really 
drilling down the what we want to do, why we want to do it. And sometimes we can get very conceptual and not think about how we're going to implement it. So going slow to go fast so that you can implement with um, thoughtfulness will go a long way. Thank you so much. So I think that's it for our individual panelist time. We're going to hop into some action planning here for a few minutes. And then again, we have some more time at the end um, to take more of your questions and to hear more from our panelists. So just thank you all so much um, for all of your wisdom that you just shared with us today. So I'm going to model this action planning here in just a moment, but this really just to lay it out, what we're asking you to think through is after hearing all of the panelists today, what are your top three priorities? And for each of those priorities, what is one action that you can do now towards addressing each of those priorities? You know, sometimes it can feel so daunting of a task, like something so big that we can't really figure out where to start. So start thinking of small steps that you can take now towards some bigger pieces of the work. And it may be as simply as scheduling a meeting or reaching out to a family or pulling some data. So as I go through this, take a moment, think about where your individual school building or where your district is, and then I'm going to model an example for you now. Okay, let's see. So if I were listening today, as I was, the biggest things that I heard that I would prioritize in my district might be, first is to listen to students and families to understand their needs and co-plan with them using equity as a design driver. Second, I would create a space where staff feel valued, heard, and offered a voice in the decision-making as plans are created. And number three is really reconsider my policies, including attendance and discipline with a real focus on equity and inclusion. So you can see with the first one, I've got students and families needs covered. With the second one, I'm really thinking about my staff. And in the third, I'm really prioritizing those policies that affect our practices. So for each of those, my action steps, and I've built them out a little bit more here than you might at this point, but you could actually break these down into some smaller steps. So for the first priority around listening to students and families, this could be done in a variety of ways. So it might be to like, gather some existing data. We, ha we have loads of data um, that we never use or we don't use it well. So gather some existing data create some time and space to better understand the challenges and the needs, but also the successes and the hopes of students and families, and then begin to co-plan and co-create solutions to address those needs. So I might schedule some listening forums, or I might co-plan some sessions with them. So we keep hearing from educators right now, well, we don't have time to all of this. This is all aspirational stuff. Well, actually, these are the things that we can do now to begin a different way of being in the work. So let's create the time and the space now. We don't have to do it all, but let's start laying the foundation for that. For the second one, focus on staff. My action might be to design and schedule a staff retreat before students return to really listen, to learn, to acknowledge and affirm all of their stresses, all of their concerns, and all of their successes in the last few months. A lot of folks have learned a lot of great new ways of teaching and facilitating. So I wanna hear about those too. And then really create those opportunities for community care and connection that have nothing to do with work. And then for those policies, I know this won't happen immediately, but I can begin a process in partnership with students and families to begin to conduct a review of our discipline and attendance policies to really determine, are they inclusive and equitable and trauma sensitive and culturally appropriate? And then as the year moves forward, we can begin to revise those if we need to. So let me, let me um, actually open it back up to our students. When we think about all of the priorities that you mentioned today, what would be like a specific example or a specific action that you feel like school and district leaders could take right now to um, meet one of your priorities? 
One thing that I'd ask them to do right away is think about communication. I think so many um, of the issues around communication are uh, rooted in a lack of transparency. And uh, if students and families and community members were a part of decision making, um, it would be much, much easier for that information to be transferred and be heard and uh, feel like confident in, in the decisions being made. So particularly with going back to school and ensuring um, safety, um, I think that communication piece is really vital. Yeah, I would, I would just add, um, you know, we're making those decisions about how we're returning back to school and those Zoom meetings are happening. Um, just find a way to get a couple students, like ask students, do you want to be on this meeting? Do you have any public comments that you want um, you know, adults in the room to be aware of, um, just so that as we're making those plans to go back, what it really feels like and that students actually are being listened to when making those decisions. And I'd add not just the students who tend to succeed in school, oftentimes students are chosen for advisory councils and commissions um, based on things like grades and teacher recommendations, and that inadvertently um, limits the voices that you're hearing from in a really detrimental way. So these kinds of opportunities um, should really just baseline be open to anyone. Um, and not just restricted for those who can succeed in school, because we know that's correlated with all different kinds of privilege from race to socioeconomic status um, and parents' education. So just want to make that point as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And before I um, give Veronica a moment to, to share, there was a comment that came up that I thought was really powerful. Um, families also need to be given the opportunity to know that they are enough and that at home, they also must set boundaries. So in our first webinar in this series, we talked a lot about creating and establishing healthy boundaries. And that goes for our families and our students too. So we need to give them opportunities to even establish what those boundaries are um, and to know that they are enough regardless of what they're capable or not capable of doing um, during these stressful times. So Veronica, do you have any um, immediate action steps that um, you think are a priority for our school and district leaders? Yes, I saw some really great things in the chat around talking to families, find out what they're feeling and thinking before they enter back into the school space. Again, they've been through a lot of trauma and that trauma has to be dealt with. Again, don't expect the school to do it all, but how are you partnering with mental health providers in your community because if that trauma is not dealt with, it's only going to compound and get worse and students are not gonna be able to focus in their online learning. Families and students are not gonna be able to focus um, when school's back in session. Um, so really just thinking about how do we address that trauma and create those loving communities where families could support educators, right? And educators could support families where we have that holistic approach where families community students and educators are all supporting each other because really we are all in this together and the, you know and dur living during this traumatic time we're only going to get th through this together with love support and compassion for one another so i'd really think about educators how do we get our minds right to absorb the vicarious trauma that's going to come when school's back in session and you're going to hear what your students experienced over the summer um, so how do you prepare yourselves and then how do you prepare to support them um, is going to be really big because that actually really creates trust. Families, when they see that love and that empathy and compassion coming, they're going to want to participate more and they're going to want to be involved because that'll feel like a safe space where they're actually heard, valued, and seen. So I think if we create that environment, families are going to be really actively participating and ready to support teachers and their child's learning in really beautiful and holistic ways. Thanks, Veronica. I just saw something coming up through the chat too around um, a priority around shifting mindsets about the ways that we view families uh, in this work. So perfect, yes. uh, perfect segue for that. And then before I um, ask Kayleen what she thinks the most immediate action step is around her priorities, um, you know, I saw something come up in the a, resor a resource shared on tap in and tap out for teachers. So teachers are the most under-resourced and overextended people out there right now. 
Um, I mean, traditionally, but certainly right now. So we need to be able to take care of ourselves and of each other um, while we're in school or while we're at home trying to homeschool our own children and teach at the same time. Um, so Kayleen, is there anything that you think would be an immediate action step um, based on the priorities that you outlined today? There's so much that we're doing, isn't there? So I'll do my best to really highlight the value of time as we talk about the trauma and our individual stress response, every single one of us here today and in the audience has been a student. So I think knowing that we have activating things for our adult staff that we're supporting similarly to our students and our families, having that presupposition and really being open and vulnerable so that we can start connecting because when we feel safe, we can mitigate the impact of stressors and traumatic events. And feeling safe is different than doing things procedurally that are safe. It's really that gut level. Sometimes we have a response in our body and we don't know why. That's that visceral piece that I mentioned earlier. We get evocative cues all around us. And for whatever reason, based on our individual narrative, we will respond without being able to reason and react in a way at times that's expected. So I think the number one for me, as I said before, was creating that platform where we're vulnerable and we're sharing these experiences so that we can be connected. And of course, that means time, time to support and effectively come up with plans. Thank you, Kaylee. That's really powerful. Um, so for Zoe and Emmanuel, um, one of the questions was, how do we help teachers share power with youth to move past all of the stress and fear that we're experiencing right now? Yeah, I wanna start by seconding, Christina, what you said. Um, I think students recognize that teachers are underpaid and overworked. Um, we've been seeing this so much in the open response questions we ask on our study. Um, this need for empathy is, is really crucial, um, but it's also there already and students do recognize it um, largely. So I think if teachers can see students as an asset um, and work with them, um, there's so much potential for, for moving forward and sharing power as the question kind of asked. And I think that happens um, in so many ways, but for starters, if students can be engaged in um, deciding what they learn and how they learn it, and if we can change mindset to uh, students teaching and learning and teachers learning and teaching, um, that's a really crucial component of what it might mean to co-design. And I'll just add quickly to, I think vulnerability is a big thing. Um, so like Emmanuel was saying that you know, students recognize that their teachers are under a lot of stress. And so I think, um, especially in this moment, there's no pressure to be perfect. Students know that teachers have a lot going on at home and teachers know that students have a lot going on at home. Um, so just extending that extra grace, but also being open about um, your struggles and challenges with the pandemic, I think opens a lot of discourse with your students um, for them to also talk about what's going on with them um, amidst everything going on. I think that's a beautiful way for us to wrap this up today on empathy, compassion, vulnerability, openness, and willingness to just listen and dialogue. Um, so that is it for me. I want to thank you all so much for opening yourselves up and being vulnerable and speaking your truth today, your thoughts and your experiences that you shared and the ideas that you shared will really influence decisions being made for years to come. And I just want to say to our panelists, as well as our audience full of educators, I see you, I hear you, and I care about you. And for the adults that are here today, remember to be gentle and realistic. And at the same time, let's make a commitment for us to not only do better, but to be better. We have this unprecedented opportunity to change now. So not just providing supports and services to students and families or for them, but really be in the work with them. 